Hey, I'm Lindsay Hahn. You might remember me as Beatrice or Belle from Star Trek Voyager. You are listening to Trek Untold. to Trek Untold, the Star Trek podcast that goes beyond the stars. I'm your host, Matthew Kaplowitz. The holodeck is a place where anything can happen. Starfleet crews can play games of World War II with the Herosian, Betazoids and Klingons can take mud baths, and Victorian-era supervillains can gain sentience and try to take over starships. But in this episode of Trek Untold, why not take things a bit more tame with an actor who's three times in Star Trek, all involved her at a very young age inside the holodeck. And that performer is Lindsay Hahn. Lindsay appeared three times on Star Trek Voyager as a child. First as Beatrice Burley on that holodeck program that Captain Janeway enjoyed, Janeway Lambda 1, in the first season episode, Learning Curve, and again as that same character in season two during Persistence of Vision. Lindsay returned to Voyager in season three, this time playing Belle, the holographic daughter of the Doctor in the heartbreaking episode, Real Life. This one messed me up, and if you guys haven't watched it in a long time, you probably should. Just make sure you have a box of tissues nearby when you do. For Lindsay, Star Trek was really part of the kickoff to her career, and she had some great roles before and especially after that, including parts in shows and films like Village of the Damned, The Color of Friendship, True Blood, Brave New Girl, Broken Bridges, Adam's Family Reunion, Third Rock from the Sun, Melrose Place, Diagnosis Murder, Without a Trace, and many more. She's worked with the Disney Channel, been a singer on movie soundtracks, and these days she's doing a lot of work behind the lens, which we're going to also chat about. Lindsay is as talented as she is exuberant, with some experiences unlike many of my other guests out there. I mean, really, how many of them have actually sung on stage with Willie Nelson and Toby Keith? I personally can't think of any, although I would like to see Jonathan Frakes play trombone with that duo. That's just me putting it out there into the universe. But that really is a podcast of a different kind, so with all that said, let's get ready to enter the holodeck and beyond with the extraordinary Lindsay Hahn. But before we begin this week's episode, I want to remind you to follow Trek Untold on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Trek Untold, all one word. You can get show updates, check out some fun memes, and let me know what you think about what's going on with the current events in the Star Trek universe. You can also support this show directly on Patreon at patreon.com slash Trek Untold, where you can support this show for as little as $2 a month. At higher tiers, you can listen to the shows before they come out, know about my guests well in advance, and even have a chance to ask them questions, get transcripts of these episodes to make sure you get all the info, and more benefits coming soon, including watch parties and live streams. But that's all dependent on more fans like you coming over and letting me know you want to be a part of events like that. If you want some Trek Untold merchandise, check out our store for gear and apparel, including shirts, hats, stickers, water bottles, notebooks, and a whole lot more. New designs will be added throughout the year, so it's always worth taking a peek. Trek Untold also has an Amazon shop where you can peruse everything Star Trek, sci-fi, and geeky on Amazon in one convenient location. If you're looking for a gift for the Trekkie in your life, or maybe want to see some of my favorite non-Star Trek things that you can get for yourself, Check out the link for my Amazon shop in the show notes on the audio version and in the description below this video on YouTube. If you're listening to us on iTunes or any other audio platforms that allow for ratings and reviews, please leave us a five-star rating and a positive review to help out this show. If you're watching it on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe to us at youtube.com at Trek Untold and give the video a thumbs up and a comment. All of these things help more people find this show and to continue growing and bringing you awesome guests each and every week. Now, without further ado, let's beam in this week's guest. Computer, access interview file. And welcome back to Trek Untold. And now joining me on the other side of the screen, she's been a Victorian era child, a recovering alcoholic country music singer, a murderous psychic alien, a hot (laughs) wings waitress who hangs out with way too many vampires, and also... A napkin. We are joined today <laughs> by Lindsay Hahn. Lindsay, how's it going? Good. How are you? I'm good. I did my homework. <laughs> you really did. The napkin part threw me. That movie's not even really out yet. <laughs> we're, we're finishing music on it right now. 
<laughs> yeah, we're going to get back to that part a little bit later on because I know you've done a lot of different things in this industry. And yeah, we're going to talk about that. So uh, yeah, let's just, let's just jump on in here, Lindsay. And I'd like to ask you the first question I ask all my guests. And that's, what's your earliest memory of Star Trek? Were you a fan of it? Oh, of Star Trek. Um, I When I was really little, um, my uncle used to watch it. And, and basically, I just remember the ship. I just remember that iconic shot from the beginning and the music from the classic, you know, original series. Um, and then later, I I watched it a bit after after being on Voyager. Um, I watched a little bit. I watched Deep Space Nine and loved Deep Space Nine. And um, and then I rewatched the classic again at like, I don't know, maybe that was like 10 years ago. <laughs> Um, but I, then I like had this whole new appreciation for it. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm big into the universe. I'm not like a super nerd fan. Like I can't, you know, I have a lot of friends who are super fans and, and I do not, I, I cannot like roll you know, with the same, like, oh, this happened in this episode, and da 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 Like, I, I am just like a, I, a, what what would you call me? You might call me like a tourist, you know? <laughs> like, but I, I love it, and, and I appreciate it, and, and it's also nice to watch when I'm, like, stressed out, you know what I mean? There's something about, like, the insular world and the good characters that's just sort of like, ah, it's nice. <laughs> There's never a bad time to watch Star Trek, that's the truth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'd like to get uh, some more background information about you, Lindsay. Can you tell us uh, where you were born, who your parents were, and what they did, and what little Lindsay wanted to be when she grew up? Oh, I uh, I was born in Las Vegas. Uh, my family is from there, um, and my my parents had already moved to California, but my dad was on tour. Um, he toured with a bunch of different bands, most notably. Air supply. <laughs> so he, he's Was sort he of ever out of as, love. Yeah. <laughs> he's sort of known as the guitarist of air supply, but he he toured with a lot of different bands. And um, and so my mom went back to her grandparents' house to stay with them during the end of her pregnancy. So she would have some support. And then and then she had me. And then after I was four months old, they they came back to LA. So my husband always teases me. He's like, You're not an LA native because I was born in Vegas. Um and then what did I want to be? I was thinking about this recently. Um, when I was in kindergarten, they had us make like posters for our graduation ceremony of like what we wanted to be. And I could not decide. And I remember drawing like a, a slash in between the poster and one top of it was an astronaut. And it was like me on the moon. And then the other one was the president. <laughs> Oh, so you're dreaming big. I guess. I guess. Um, and then, oh, and then the kindergarten teacher was like, don't you, because I had just started acting at that point. And she was like, don't you want to be an actor? And I remember I had to choose between the two. And I, I'm pretty sure that I crossed out president and drew a camera. God, I wish I still had that poster. Because that's like exact. That's like this. Here we are. <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy. <laughs> So, you know, when you're not trying to become an astronaut and become a president of the United States of America, when do you decide you want to start trying your hand in acting? Like, when, when did you discover performing? Um, well, I, you know, I can't take too much credit for that being like an original idea of my own. A friend of the family, she worked for a children's agency and she was trying to get my parents to um, let me be in commercials from the time I was born. Oh. But then when I was in kindergarten, she, my dad was on tour and she got my dad to call the preschool to release me. She picked me up and took me to my first audition and called my mom who was at work. My mom was a bartender at the Four Seasons Hotel and, uh, and, and I booked my first audition and, and I really liked it. So then my parents kind of were like, okay, I guess we won't resist this if she likes it. And, uh, and, and that's what happened basically. I was a pretty shy kid, but then there was something about it that I don't know that I really liked. Was that first gig the uh, Little Caesars commercial? Uh, no, it was actually uh, an industrial commercial for, was it Macintosh? 
it was like an, an in-house industrial. I just remember that I got to ride on a scooter and lick an ice cream cone the entire time. And it was like the greatest thing in the world. I was like, of course, I want to do this for the rest of my life. <laughs> wow, that's that's pretty awesome. That's a pretty great memory here. And yeah, I do want to mention for our listeners that uh, Lindsay's time in Star Trek does happen kind of fairly on, I feel like, in your career, at least on like TV stuff. So I want to come back to that a little bit later on. Because yeah. uh, I do want to talk about a few other things you've worked on. And uh, one of the things I saw on your resume that was really cool, besides the Little Caesars commercial, which you're welcome to talk about, uh, you know, I-, I wanted to ask you about uh, Village of the Damned. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because we got Christopher Reeve, Kirstie Alley, Mark Hamill's in that too, uh, Thomas mm-hmm. Decker, who you also did Voyager with, we'll talk about. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a heck of a movie. I actually, I feel like I remember watching that as a kid for some reason. I think it was on like syndicated TV at some point and I watched it and like, I, I just checked some uh, scenes out on YouTube in fact for this interview again. And I was like, I remember the brick wall scene. I love that scene. So uh, <laughs> I mean, you're working with some, some big yeah. names here, man. And you're a young little person here. So yeah. Talk to me about village of the damned. That, that seems like such a weird, but awesome movie to be a part of. Yeah. That's, that's a really good way to put it. It was weird and awesome. Um, I really, that was my first time really working working with the director who treated me with like the not I don't want to say treated me like an adult which he did but he was also John was so kind and um but treated me with the respect of an artist like the way that he would direct me the way he would talk to me it was like the first time that I I felt yeah, really, really respected and valued that way, which was very cool because it was a really demanding role. You know, I, I we did like nine auditions, you know, and um, and it was grueling because this is a character that is, you know, an actually an older alien in the body of a child and can read minds. And so like, you know, you have all these little kids trying to memorize these like three page dialogues because or monologues because there's nobody saying anything on the other end of them because you can read their mind you know and you're using these giant words that you've never heard in your life you know so I remember having to learn all these words and then like my um my acting coach at the time uh had this idea where I just had to never blink because of the whole thing with the eyes glowing and everything and so like he added that element to it, which was intense, but great. Also, my my acting coach was really awesome. Like I wasn't in, it definitely wasn't any kind of like a, you know, a horrible situation. It was just very demanding, you know? Um, and then, and then when I got it, I was really excited because my, up until that point, you know, I started when I was like four and a half, five, and I did Village of the Dam when I was nine. Yeah. Up until that point, I had played characters that were getting kidnapped, characters that were sick, characters that were broken. And I was like, I want to play the bad guy. Like I wanted to have some power. I wanted to have some agency on me. And the only way that I could think of that happening was if I could play the bad guy, you know? And so when I got that role, I was just so, 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 so excited. And Thomas and I um, lived together during that whole shoot. So in the same little bed and breakfast. So, and and then, so then we got Star Trek together and it was like crazy. And also the, the hairdresser on, was it, was she the hairdresser or the makeup artist? I'm pretty sure, she, no, she was the hairdresser. Um, Yeah, she was a hairdresser on Village of the Damned, was also the hairdresser on Star Trek. It was crazy. So it was like the, the family was back together. Yeah, that is seriously a small world. Uh, mm-hmm. And I mean, yeah, I want to talk a little bit about Christopher Reeve, too, because, I mean, that man is a powerhouse. And again, you're talking about how this is a very taxing role, especially for a young person to play. Very dense dialogue and a lot of it. Uh, I would imagine it's a very long shoot also. You can tell me how long that was if you'd like. But um... Um, it was I think it was originally supposed to be two months. But then um, some, some crazy stuff happened where, like, the local people in Point Reyes, they were re- that's where we were shooting. They were really upset that we were shooting there because um because John Carpenter had shot his last movie there and like all the local people were just like I don't want this you know Hollywood in our town anymore I mean I don't think they actually had those kinds of accents but um (laughs) that's probably unfair um but a couple of them were just really upset and then like suddenly John's house was on fire and so we had to postpone the shoot and then come back so I think 
I think the shoot ended up being three months or four months, I think, because wow. we had to go away and come back. Was that the longest yeah. you've ever done a shoot before? Yes. Yeah. Because oh. I, I never was a kid that worked like as a series regular on a television show. Like I had other friends who did that. My mom didn't want me to do that um, because she didn't want me to like, you know, spend my whole life on set. She wanted me to have some time in the real world. Um, so yeah, so I, I hadn't done that, but a lot of people that I knew it was not their longest shoot. Like I, I was kind of like, you know, a newbie to shooting for that long. <laughs> So yeah, on that note too, though, I'd love to hear about Christopher Reeve. And again, also, you know, Kirstie Allen, yeah, she's Star right. Trek alumni. And yeah, I got sidetracked too, because I was asking about that, that length, because that's a crazy shoot. But yeah, I mean, yeah. Christopher Reeve's got to be amazing. I'd love to hear any stories with him. And, you know, again, oh Kirstie Allen, Trek alumni, Mark Hamill, he's from the other franchise, but I'll allow it today. Um, but yeah, let's just talk about those folks. And, you know, what was it like with them on screen and off? So um, it's funny because Kirstie Alley and Christopher Reeve both had completely different ways of working with the kids. Ah. Kirstie Alley she would crack jokes before she was like so personable with us she loved us so much and and it, she would challenge us by making us laugh right before um john would call action and one of the times um is the scene where we kill her you know when we we all like we walk down the steps with her and we're like mind controlling her to like take a scalpel and you know, gut herself basically. And right before that, she's telling us jokes and trying to get us to crack up. Um, so if you watch the movie, I don't know, see if you can see it on our faces because it was every single time. She was like, this is gonna be so funny if we can see this later. Um, but uh, so so she dealt with us that way. But then um, Christopher Reeve also respected I think that they're both valuable ways, you know, to deal with it because Christopher Reeve really wanted to keep our relationship professional and mm. clean. And um, I think also with his method, maybe he didn't want to get attract get um attached to me as like a young child. So we we really he stayed away. And then when we worked together, it was like very professional, very clean. But then um, he did an interview on, uh, on the tonight show. And he said that the girl who played his daughter, he was trying to like stay scared of her or something, which, which was me. I played his daughter. And he was like, but, uh, but then, you know, I'd, I'd be walking away from set and she would just like sing the sound of music at the drop of a hat and was like, <laughs> like this like show kid so it was nice that he said that because I was like oh he did like me you know but it, not that he was ever mean he was just like really professional and wanted to keep our relationship uh in the best place it could be for our performances I think which is super smart and really good for me as a kid to have the different you know the different kinds of people to work with to train me you know for later um and then Mark Hamill, I was just like totally, I, speaking of nerding out, I mean, actually all of them is the truth because I loved Superman. And my grandmother's favorite movie was um, A Wrinkle in Time. Hmm. And so I grew up watching those movies. So I loved Christopher Reeve, like loved him. And then I loved Kirstie Alley because I also would stay up late watching Cheers. Cheers is still one of my favorite shows of all time on television ever. And so that was very cool. Also, Look Who's Talking had come out. So I was very excited uh, about that. But then like, I mean, Luke, Luke, Sky, Luke Skywalker. So that was, that was very cool. <laughs> I feel like it's like enough said. I know like, your Twitter yeah. name is uh, Han Solo Project, right? And so like it's yeah, pretty clear. Yeah, um... I know, I know. I'm like, oh, all these all, all these Star Trek people see my Twitter name and they're like, ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> I like you both. <laughs> You know, what's really interesting, too, is like this is a John Carpenter horror movie and yeah. you are among a group who are a bunch of kids. This is like yeah. some serious, crazy horror stuff here. So I'm like wondering, you know, I mean, you got to read all these lines you're doing this here in this movie. You know what's happening. But like, how yeah. much do you know what's happening? I mean, are you scared of stuff that's going on, too? Uh, I mean, how is this as a challenge for just you being a kid filming this movie? Um, I knew exactly what was happening. I'm not sure if it was kept from the other kids. I was the oldest of everybody. I was nine and we ranged from six to nine. Thomas was the youngest. Ah. Thomas was six. Um, but I'm pretty sure he was fairly aware of what we were doing too. I thought it was so cool because I grew up, I grew up with my dad who was like a cinephile and didn't totally get that you're not supposed to show kids stuff <laughs> young, you know what I mean? So like, 
I saw The Shining young. I saw Poltergeist young. Um, so I was really into how the movie magic happened. You know what I mean? Like I, anytime I was on a set when I was a kid, I was so excited to be on Star Trek because I, I wanted to see the makeup. I wanted to see how it was done. I wanted to see the holodeck, what that was. I wanted to see the, you know, um, the cockpit. I want, you know what I mean? Like I, I just was really, really, really into how movies were made. So what being on a John Carpenter set, I was always like, into the um the special effects i made friends with the special effects guys because they also had to do like a cast of my head and stuff to turn me into the thing at the end and <laughs> spoiler alert <laughs> and, um and i was always just so excited whenever new um special effects you know puppets or whatever came in i they knew to get me because i wanted to see them and and i wanted to see how the dead bodies looked i was a weird kid you know <laughs> I liked the dark stuff. I liked the weird sciencey stuff. I was, I was really into the fact that they were supposed to be aliens. Um, I, I was definitely, I've always been more into the sci-fi side of horror rather than the like other side of horror. Rather than like the slasher gore, guts falling out kind of gore. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. I wasn't really into that stuff, even though I mean that's you know I respect, I respect it. <laughs> I respect it and I appreciate it as an adult as an artist but growing up that was not that was not what I was into I was like into tremors you know what I mean like that was such a cool movie what, what were those things you know <laughs> well let's go from uh, murderous children and sandworms over to something more wholesome because uh, I saw on your resume that you did an episode of diagnosis murder and uh, I would love to know if you got a chance to hang out with Dick Van Dyke I did I what did what is that like that's gotta be you know, amazing I've never had anybody ask me about this. Um, so good on you. Um, I did. And it was amazing. It was amazing. And, you know, I've been revisiting that memory recently because I just showed my daughter, um, who is one and a half. I showed her Mary Poppins. Ah. And, um, and she loves Bert. She loves Dick Van Dyke. And um, she's obsessed with penguins now because of the penguin dance that he, do he did. I feel that that's probably maybe the top person that I, I, I feel the most honored to, like I even talking about it right now, I feel like I want to cry. I think that he was such an underrated actor, you know, yeah. even though like it's Dick Van Dyke, everybody loves Dick Van Dyke, but like we, we were talking about it and we're like, he should have got like Oscars upon Oscars. Like he had, he had such an instrument. He handled stuff so well. He he was able to do all different colors of emotions and comedy and still keep it real. And I, I, just, I cannot believe that I got to have a smile, let alone a conversation from such a such an amazing piece of cinem cinematic history. You know what I mean? Like he really he really does feel like some kind of like cinematic deity to me, you know? Um, and he was just, he was just really kind. I just remember him like crouching down and smiling at me and saying, hi. And like, I don't totally remember what our conversation was because the whole time I just kept thinking, it's Bert, you know? <laughs> but I remember he had silver hair and he looked older, but I, I could still see him through him looking older. And, and I, I just couldn't believe it. I, I still can't believe it that I met him. I mean, Dick Van Dyke is just timeless. Like, he's going to be one of those performers, you know, we still hop out 50, 60, 100 years, if not more, into the future about his contributions on screen. My God, he he's just incredible. It, I, I, yeah, I, I'm floored that I ever met him. Still. <laughs> well, I'm glad we kind of pivoted into a little bit of a Disney talk, too, because, you know, Mary Poppins is a Disney thing here, and I want to talk Disney with you, because okay. uh, you, know, you were involved with the Disney Channel for, for some time here, and uh, I think the first thing you did was The Color of Friendship. Yeah. And I so, you know, I do my research. I do my homework. I like to watch as much as I can with the folks. And I found that that is on Disney Plus. So I watched it. And like, and so <laughs> number one here, I want to just point this out here. Like, I didn't exactly go into it with like high expectations. Mm -hmm. But even then, like, you know, because it's just a Disney Channel movie. I was like, whatever. I, I used to watch those on TV, whatever, all the time. Yeah. Yo, Lindsay. Yo. <laughs> that movie was like so legit good. I, I'm like angry that it's so good. I, I really liked it. Uh, I really recommend kids check this out and adults check it out. So like, it's, you know, 
it covers some real heavy stuff. I mean, we'll talk about this going to a base here. Folks who don't know A Color of Friendship, uh, it is essentially a, a piece about, you know, you play a South African girl during apartheid times who comes on a foreign exchange trip and ends up living with a black family who is also having some racial tensions. And the father of that family is, uh, I, I think it's a senator, I believe it was, or politician of some kind. Congressman. Congressman Ron Dellums, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, there's like some heavy stuff. And you guys are dealing with racism in a way that's just like, I don't think it's been done since that way. No. And the fact that it was like framed around like South African apartheid as well, like just made it, yeah, you know, we'll, we'll get into it. But I mean, let's just first talk about just memories of that film. Cause like, wow, what a great, by the way, just what a great job you did too. But um, what thank a wonderful you. film. Oh, thank you. I'm, uh, thank you. That's so touching. Um, It's, it's, it's probably my, the, the thing I'm the most proud of doing in all honesty, because, uh, because it was dealing such he with such heavy subject matter, but also because it was for kids, you yeah. know what I mean? Which I felt like that was such an untapped, I don't want to say untapped market because that sounds weird, but like that, you know, we, a market we where I think like a lot of movies and shows have like almost talked down to kids. Yeah, we just yeah. don't trust kids with the information. And, and the way that the writers, the way that Kevin Hooks, the director, handled telling that story to children um, it was just so incredible. It, and and to be a part of the making of that um is something i'm i'm still just uh so so honored to be a part of i feel like this is like just what i said about dick van dyke but but really like i feel really lucky and and i still get recognized for it when i go out you know and um and that is so cool to me it is never anything that i ever get sick of hearing it's it's never something that i yeah it, it's it was just such a cool thing to be a part of. And and then later, um, Alan Sachs, who produced it, who also created Welcome Back, Cotter, uh, and I'm still friends with him, by the way, uh, he put it in, he started as a teacher. And so then he developed a whole curriculum around it and then put it in 20,000 schools across America to teach kids about apartheid during Black History Month. So it was just like, it was, it was very, very, very cool to be a part of to be a part of that and and bringing awareness to that and, and treating kids with you know the dignity and respect of like being actual human beings who also need to learn about important things <laughs> i mean yeah that's the truth about it is it, it covers so many important topics and like number one i mean this is a disney movie where you say the n-word i mean you try and find a disney movie where that's actually said that doesn't exist but it's actually still out there and it's not censored on disney plus that to me just like shows you how important this film is and how much like how serious they're taking it and how much they want kids to know this is a thing. Like, you know, you're, you're talking to uh, to your scene partner and you're like basically, you know, we have like this many words for black people, but there's only one word for white. Yeah. And it's just like, like, wow, that's like, you know, and I got to tell you, there's a scene you have um, with, uh, you've said his name, right? I can't remember now, but the uh, congressman where you're like, yeah, you can't fall asleep yeah. one night and uh, you're like, you're, you're downstairs reading Roots. And like that got me to actually order the book. Uh, just recently wow. so I, yeah yeah i was like wow i should read that because that's like again a great tv series Un unrelated to this but like the movie just did such a great job of like you know i'm an adult and it made me think differently and so it just cool. made me just look at things in a different light i guess i don't know made me want to just become more in touch with that so um you know it's really amazing and uh god yeah just serious deep deep stuff but uh, on a star trek note you are in this film with good old cast d8s from ds9 and that is cool there's a star trek connection in here too so uh, do you have any memories of working with her? Because you do have a lot of scenes with her. He's, she's basically your uh, your away team mom, if you will. Let's call her that. Oh my gosh, I love her. Well, I, I I still see her at events sometimes. We're like, ah, um, she's a fantastic actress, um, but also just a just a really cool person to work with. Another person who treated us, you know, with with the respect of of being artists, and um, but also sort of took both of us, took Shadi and I both under her wing and, um, you know, would just give us like little, little, I don't know, uh, pep talks, you know, and, and focus us in our scenes and, um, you know, just being in the room with her made you a better actor, you know, she, cause she just sort of demanded, it wasn't even that she demanded, it was just that her, her presence just is, it is, you know, thespian, but not in like, not in like a um, farcical kind of a way or, or like a stuck up kind of a way. But she, she just really brings this like, um, 
this presence everywhere that she goes. And, and so to work with her, you just kind of stood up a little bit straighter and you mm. focused a little bit more and you centered yourself a little bit more and you thought a little bit harder. Um, I loved working with her. Yeah, Penny Johnson is amazing. I'm dying to get her on the show. Yeah, uh, and- you know, when she was on 24 too, I was watching 24 and I was like, <gasps> Because I was like, I was obsessed with that show. And then I was like, yes, like every time her character did me, <laughs> hey, I was like, I'm so into it. <laughs> I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like this movie kind of left a pretty big mark on you too. So I'd love to know, like personally for you, uh, what did you take away from doing The Color of Friendship? And maybe not even necessarily like the political message or anything like that, but just, you know, the overall experience of what you did and the material that you worked with and what you came away with. Ooh, um... Well, you know, I I learned about the apartheid through the experience. I learned about, you know, I grew up in LA and LA is, you know, I would never say past any kind of racism, but but it's it's way more hidden here. We're we're a melting pot. You know, I I went to school with kids of of every race, every ethnicity. Um, So I never really, I, I didn't, I kind of thought of racism as this thing that that was in my mom's time. Yeah. You know what I mean? And and I remember the first time that I heard about slavery while doing, you know, in history class, my mom was reading me a history book for um, you know, for homework. And I cried for like three days straight. I couldn't believe it. You know, I couldn't believe that, that happened. But I had still sort of thought of it as this thing that happened a really long time ago. So when I when I started auditioning for this and learning about the apartheid, it really made it like more like, oh, my God, like this, this was happening. Like this was still half this kind of a crazy thing was still happening. And um, and it definitely just opened up my eyes to to another experience. You know what I mean? Other than my like privileged white kid in L.A. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um and and you know it was it was super educational and and not really realizing that I hadn't worked on a show with a bunch of black people, mm. and then all of a sudden I was on a set with a bunch of, and didn't think anything of it until people started saying anything and it's, and then I realized oh yeah I've really worked with a lot of white people this whole time, you know what I mean like and just like just stuff that you just especially as a kid you just take for granted you just you don't even know to think twice about you know um and it definitely i was always kind of a kid who who was interested in social justice and interested in doing the right thing and like but it it definitely put a flavor in me that um i'm not a flavor i I feel like my vocabulary is like gone today i'm like reaching for words but um it definitely fed the drive in me to try to navigate my career into projects you know or at least jump at the chance when I ever had one uh to work on projects that really meant something like this because I feel like our art form telling stories is like one of the oldest art forms in the world and and it's the most significantly influential um way that we've ever been taught anything I mean in tribes we taught children how to hunt through stories you know we we taught them about the morning changing into nighttime through stories you know so um yeah so it it just made me really feel the impact of that and and how how powerfully good it could be which was cool yeah like i highly recommend anybody out there who has disney plus like for real look it up it's really great uh and again your performance was so so good um and yeah the whole thing is totally worth it and like yeah, you know, like I, I was pretty young when apartheid was happening, but I was alive and it's just crazy to think, you know, and, and I think this is what got me also was the fact that it's like, yeah, this happened during my lifetime. And like, I had the same kind of thought as you. It's like, this happened in my lifetime. And I, I had the same kind of thought growing up as a kid, like, you know, oh, it's in the 60s, whatever. That seems like, you know, ancient times, but like, it's really not. Yeah. Um. So cool. yeah, it's just something to think about. And uh, yeah, just again, great job. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, you know, besides working on that film, too, which, you know, the, the racist fish out of water is such an interesting concept also. But besides doing that whole film, uh, you also did some fun stuff with Disney, a little bit less serious. Mm-hmm. Uh, you got to do the movie surfers. And I found some episodes of that. That looked like so much you fun to do. Did? Where did you find them? There's this place called YouTube and there's all sorts of things <laughs> hidden, sprinkled around there. I've got to look because the last time I looked, which was honestly years ago, 
I couldn't find anything. And I have all of the original VHS tapes of every single episode. You need to start uploading and on YouTube. I know, but I don't know if Disney would like get mad at me. You know what I mean? But I, I remember I, I demanded them when I was done with the show. I demanded every Art. single episode from the producers. They were so annoyed with me. They were so annoyed. But now I'm like, I am the holder. I am the keeper of all of those episodes because they that, don't. That really was a really smart thing to do. Yeah. I mean, thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah, I, I should, I should digitize them and figure out a way to put them somewhere. I mean, they're really cool. I mean, you got to do a lot of fun stuff and be around a lot of like really interesting people. Hello, I got to learn how to surf from Kelly Slater. Like yeah, what? I mean, yeah, I saw one where you were like learning about uh, skydiving even. Um, uh, did I learn about skydiving? You didn't, you oh, didn't I actually learned... skydive, but you learned about it. I learned about it. Yeah. I went spelunking in the Carlsbad Caverns. I, uh, I went, um, this was one of the coolest experiences with Jean-Michel Cousteau. I went scuba diving and wow. swam with sharks. It was unplanned to swim with the sharks, but the sharks were there <laughs> and they were like, let's go. And I was like, well, okay, let's get to the next place. I guess we can go. I'm not in a cage, but I guess we'll just go. And um, it, that was, that was just incredible. And that was actually another one of those experiences that I was super happy to do because the, the whole slant of that segment was um, conservation and, and keeping the ocean clean and stuff. And I always tried to, to push um, our segments towards stuff like that. Even it wasn't really appropriate for, Di you know, this like Disney Channel promotional show, but that I was really happy that they gave me that one because I was always trying to push things that way. <laughs> I mean, that's really cool. I, I mean, you know, let's just say if, if swimming with the sharks with Jacques Cousteau was the best thing that you did in that show. Jean-Michel the... Cousteau, his son. His son. Okay, yeah, <laughs> let's make that clear. His son, yeah. Um, but still, it's a Cousteau, which is amazing. Yeah, yeah um, like, who cares? It's Cousteau. <laughs> so, you know, if let's say that that was the best thing. You can tell me if there's something else that topped that. But if that was the best thing, what was the worst thing you had to do in that show that you just did not want to do, but you had to do it because the show must go on? Oh, my God. Oh, there was... I just felt so embarrassed and so it felt so cheesy. It was something I think having to do with like a Lion King sequel or prequel. And I had to like, it was for really young kids. I think it was, it was supposed to be geared for really young kids. And they put me in front of a green screen and had me running. Like I had to like, whoa, like jump and run and do all these goofy things. And I remember just like feeling like this, this is low. <laughs> <laughs> you know because I was a teenager and I just so desperately didn't want to be uncool you know and it just felt so uncool in the moment and, and you know meanwhile behind the scenes I'm like in a heavy metal band and then I'm like Aah! you know it was, it was a very weird du duality in my life <laughs> and by the way I gotta ask were you part of the era of the uh, the Disney kids who had to do the I'm Lindsay Hahn and this is Disney Channel yes, did you have to do that I, yes I did yes I did those were fun they were they were um, taxing though because you had to like do it perfectly and like do a bunch of them. But, um, they were fun. I remember being excited about that. No, oh, that's interesting because I've seen like so many outtakes where folks put up on YouTube like you know here's what they were actually doing and it's like all these crazy squiggles and nowhere close to being the Mickey Mouse logo. Yeah, nowhere close. Nowhere close. <laughs> they always try to get you close, but how do you know how are you gonna do it? It's hard. <laughs> So, Lindsay, there's one other thing I want to talk about before we jump into Star Trek. And again, this is like another really cool moment from your career we alluded to earlier. Uh, that's yeah. Broken Bridges from 2006. Yeah. And, uh, you know, again, a really great movie. Uh, but what's really awesome, too, I, I want to probably focus on this part more than anything else. You got to sing with Toby Keith and Willie Friggin Nelson in a scene with Burt Reynolds hanging around. Mm -hmm. So, wow, uh, number one. And two, I mean, that must have been a day to remember on a set. Honestly, the other person that I was thinking of when we were talking about Dick Van Dyke was Willie Nelson. And I was like, I wonder if we're going to get to that. Um, yeah, that, that was, that was incredible. I remember the day that we um, recorded the music for that. Willie came in, he did two takes and he was done. Um, <laughs> but he, and, and we were in Randy Scruggs studio, which I don't know if you know any country history, but Flats and Scruggs, they were like very famous and like, you know, it's like, you know, royalty, basically. Mm. And uh, I ended up, like, I, I was friends with Randy. I still friends with Randy for, for a very long time. So that was cool. And Toby was so sweet. Um, it was definitely a total honor. I didn't really grow up in country music. You know what I mean? So I didn't, 
it, it didn't impact me yet as much as it probably would have if I had grown up in other places in the country, you know what I mean? Um, but Willie Nelson did, because Willie Nelson was somebody that was regarded in my household as like, you know, one of the greats as far as songwriting goes. And um, so that was just insane, an insane experience. And, and to work with Burt Reynolds as well, who is a hilarious character on his own, and Tess Harper and Kelly Preston, who I loved and Tess Harper she she is a fantastic actor and just talking about the craft and and you know um how how you just when you're working on a big medium um like film like a giant screen it, it is a different kind of acting than when you're working on a smaller screen because when you're working with something that's going to blow you up huge, going to blow your face up huge. All you have to do is think about an emotion and that's enough. You know, it's really easy to overact um, a motion picture film, you know. Um, but, uh, or I guess, I don't know if you would call it that a motion picture film anymore. Maybe, it's just turned into the TCM interview. In Yeah, an in-theater film, you know, <laughs> film films that used to be blown up giant. We don't really have them that much anymore. <laughs> Yeah. Um I know I'm starting to sound like a oh God, what what's his name? Harry Styles. I'm like, it's a movie, it's a movie film. It feels like a on a screen movie. Um <laughs> but, but uh yeah, it, it was very cool to work with them and and to yeah, talk. I mean, anytime you work with actors like that in over a long period of time, actors that have worked for a really long time, you always get these really cool nuggets of wisdom and and even more than that it really is just being around them that you get to really absorb you know there, there's like a wisdom in just their presence um and and I felt that way being around all of them in all honesty I mean Toby it was his first time acting but he was a veteran as far as music goes you know um so it was it was really cool and it was cool to be able to hang out with Willie Nelson multiple days in a row like hello that was awesome. He was so, so, so nice. And when, um, when I first met him and I was like, I'm such a fan. Um, there's this song called don't wake me till it's over, which is just, it's not, it's not like a, as far as I know, a massively popular Willie Nelson song, but it's one of my favorite songs ever written. And he wrote it. And, um, and when I told him that he was genuinely, genuinely not like you know this is somebody who's been told this a billion times he was genuinely like thank you so much and it was just like it was so cool it was such a reminder of like this is being on any part any kind of you know sliding scale of this level where anybody sees anything that you do in a public way and appreciates it um it really is a blessing and um and it's so cool to meet people who who don't lose sight of that and he's one of those people he's just a really genuine amazing person truck untold will return momentarily truck untold is sponsored by triple fiction productions celebrating 15 years in business in 2023 tfp creates 3d printed star trek and sci-fi inspired items that fit into any collection whether you're a cosplayer who wants a starfleet phaser a bajoran tricorder or a klingon dagger or a toy collector looking for that special accessory or diorama to make your figures truly stand out triple fiction productions has exactly what you need and for you figure fanatics that includes products that are the perfect size for galoob nego playmates and everything in between all products are 3d printed in the u.s with new designs constantly being updated on their website repeat customers can sign up for tfp's loyalty program for free where the more you order the more discounts you receive tfp also has a pay what you want section where clearance or misprinted items are available at a discounted price best of all every product can be shipped worldwide as a special bonus for listeners of this show, Trek Untold has a special discount code just for you. Enter UNTOLD10 at checkout for 10% off of all orders with no minimum purchase required. That's 10% off using UNTOLD10. To see all of their products, head to triple-fictionproductions.net. Or to stay up to date on their newest products, find them on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Triple Fiction Productions. 
where something is only impossible until it happens. Hey, I'm Licia Nav, AKA Ensign Sonia Gomez from Star Trek TNG. And now Captain Sonia Gomez on Lower Decks with her own ship, the Archimedes. Yay, I finally got a promotion after 25 years. So anyway, I'm here to talk about drivebydogooders.org. It's a little charity I run where we go to the outskirts of Skid Row and from our car windows, we hand out basic human essentials like water, wipes, cold stream cheese, socks, tarps, masks, t-shirts, things to keep people warm. So we just think that everyone deserves clean water, some protein and a way to clean themselves, especially during Corona. We also hand out masks to those who really, really need it, who live in tents on the street, mainly the disabled and elderly who have a really hard time getting to services. And we do all of this with no agenda, just pure giving, no overhead. If you'd like to go to the website and donate, it's 100% tax deductible. And if you click on the donate button, you can go right to the $35 option and pick a signed autograph picture of either the Star Trek The Next Generation or Lower Decks or Total Recall, where I played the three-breasted mutant hooker on Mars, and uh, that's the X-rated version. Put in the comments section your address and anything you'd like me to write, and I'll personally inscribe it and mail it off to you immediately. And again, that's drivebydogooders.org. Ensign, I mean, Captain Sonia Gomez, signing off. So, Lindsay, let's beam into our Star Trek discussion now. we got three episodes to talk about here. Now we're starting, they're all in Star Trek Voyager, but we're starting with uh, Learning Curve and Persistence of Vision. And you are a little Victorian child named Beatrice. Uh, so, I guess first we should kind of clarify around what time this was, because I think this was the same year as Village of the Dam. So I don't know what happened first. In oh. Village of the Dam happened first. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, I think, I, I think it was like separated... By nine months or a year or something yeah it was a like season very... difference also in the shows and the episodes yeah and i remember the casting you know when they wanted to cast both thomas and i it was an issue like they were trying to figure out if that was something they could do and if if everybody was okay with the fact that we like had just come out in this movie and that you know because it was like is this this is weird you know then it, is it like star trek is partnering with the film to promote the film which it wasn't obviously it just happened to be that we were the creative choices um and i was so excited that they allowed it that they allowed both of us to work together again and um i really liked working with thomas he was just he he was just a little adult yeah. from the time he was six years old i mean he he really was just like he's so such a crotchety six-year-old <laughs> yeah and then he ended up being in a crazy like metal band like a ziggy stardust almost kind of person have you ever looked into that I he's have not. amazing he's next on my list he's amazing we ended up playing the viper room together one year <laughs> just like totally crazy um but uh but yeah to be able to be able to work with him again um it was was a trip and he had grown up so much i mean we had both grown up so much we were kids so like nine months or a year is like a giant jump um so that was cool so how did you like wearing those outfits i mean you're not you're not in a starfleet uniform you're wearing a victorian dress there's a lot i imagine to get into that wardrobe i mean what was that like for you it was a lot and then i decided that i needed to try a french dip for the very first time in my life and definitely spilled all of the sauce all over one of the dresses and it was a giant problem <laughs> because there was only one they didn't have multiples and um so the entire production was like uh put on hold for an hour and a half while they panicked trying to get all of the sauce out of the dress and i was crying and then they're like doing my makeup i felt so bad i felt so so dumb that i did that um so yes, it was a big deal, but I loved it. I had, you know, this massive wig on and I loved it. I wanted to look like an alien. Like I was trying, I was like, are you sure, are you sure these kids in these holodecks don't have like pointy ears or something? Like I wanted some like prosthetic stuff. Um, but I didn't get that. The wig was close enough and I, I loved being in the corset and the petticoat and the, you know, big round metal ball skirt and like not being able kind of to sit down. Yeah, I, I just, I really like um, produ a, a big production. <laughs> I just really like it. And, and, and it helps you get into character. You know, it helps you um, just really feel 
completely outside of yourself, you know? Um, so I, I, I loved it. I know a lot of people complain about having to work in the, that kind of attire, but I would, I would do that all the time. Well, most important question, was the French dip worth it? Uh, yeah, man, I still order French dip all the time now. <laughs> My favorite <laughs> French dip place closed and I'm really bummed. <laughs> wow. So it's thanks to Star Trek, you discovered your love of that sandwich. I did, I did. <laughs> That's amazing. Star Trek always giving us gifts. Ooh, um, always. When I was pregnant, I ate that sandwich so much. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if I'm pregnant then, now, now I'm wondering. Uh, well, I, I, I actually was curious because we're talking about food now. I mean, you know, I know... I know that uh, Beatrice doesn't like cucumber sandwiches, but did Lin Lindsay like cucumber sandwiches? I love cucumber sandwiches. Cucumber sandwiches are also one of my favorite things. I like anything having to do with high tea. I like <laughs> things that are a big production. <laughs> so were you like munching on those in between takes? Oh yeah, hell yeah. I, are you kidding me? What is wrong with the cucumber sandwich, Beatrice? It is cream cheese. It is cucumber. It is bread. What they, these are? These are delicious, complimentary things. That's an issue. <laughs> I feel like that's a podcast for like a different day entirely. Like <laughs> the cucumber sandwich show. Yeah, I could go on. <laughs> They're tiny. They're perfect. They're bite-sized. <laughs> well, let me ask you something that's not cucumber related. Uh, I'm okay. sure she likes cucumbers too. I, she might She might not. I don't know. But uh, you know, you're working with Kate Mulgrew in your two episodes here. Uh, so what is she like to work with? I mean, that I feel like she has to be an imposing very kind of like in the same kind of way of like Christopher Reeve, like, you know, yeah. very mature, kind of separate from you guys. Like, how was she to work with? she she was she was slightly warmer than christopher reeve but then also our dynamic was supposed to be you know sort of like nanny and children yeah. so i think i think that if our dynamic had to be what it was with christopher and i it, she probably would have backed off a little bit more but she also had like a giant workload because she was the, the captain so she was in a ton of scenes and it wasn't like we got a ton of time you know to like kick it with her you know, when we when we weren't shooting because then she was going and shooting something else you know um but she was very nice she I, I remember her being warmer than I thought she was going to be because I watched the show and so I thought that you know she was going to be the captain but she was actually just like a really cool lady and I liked her a lot very strong and um very cool for me as a as a young girl to be on a show where you know, had a female captain as strong as her and not like hypersexualized, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so that I remember feeling like, like, yeah, you know, <laughs> like, yeah, let's put this in perspective too. This is, uh, I, I believe both of them are season one that you did season one of Voyager. So, I mean, she's still finding her way. I don't know what she's dealing with behind the scenes in terms of you right. know, being the first female lead in a Star Trek series. So, I mean, she has a lot of weight in her shoulders. Yeah. Thank God she didn't have Twitter, right? <laughs> <laughs> Instagram she she just had to deal with hate mail that was like physically mailed to her <laughs> I don't know which one's worse though to be fair I know that's true that's true <laughs> and you know talk about some of the dialogue that you did too because this is like some thick chewing the scenery dialogue here it's pretty dense stuff here but it sounds like I mean you already had experience from Village of the Dam doing lines like this so I mean was, was it much of a stretch for you no I the accent we really wanted to make sure was good and so we worked with um dialect coaches Thomas and I um, we had a couple of, of nights where we hung out and watched Mary Poppins <laughs> and watched um which is funny that that would come up again but you know watched not just British accents but British child accent and it also had to have a certain kind of a British child accent you know what I mean couldn't be cockney couldn't you know it really had to be like upper class so um that that was most of the work that went into it and my you know memorization is a muscle and coming off of doing village of the damned which was like boot camp like that was intense the kids would be playing outside and i would be in my trailer just drilling lines drilling lines drilling lines you know um so coming off of that it was kind of a piece of cake for me um <laughs> that being said i don't know what it would be like for me now because <laughs> not have the same muscle <laughs> I mean, I but do when I... you on your accents because i was actually asking about that i mean between that and color friendship where you had like a very convincing i felt like south african accent like because i i had a friend who a white guy from south africa and like it sounded like it was like you had a little bit of the dutch afrikaans going on in there thank so, I mean, you you're, yeah. you're very good at that so like how hard is it to pick up an accent and do it right and do it convincingly 
Oof. Well, yeah, I mean, The Color of Friendship, that was how that was a boot camp. That was a real boot camp in dialect. Um, I had, I went into the audition with the same acting coach, who was amazing. He, they had said, you don't have to have, Disney Channel had said, you don't have to have an accent coming into the audition. And my acting coach was like, yes, you do. <laughs> it was like, he was like, you got to have a, at least a flavor of it. So he made me track down um, and I finally did it Hollywood video. Uh, they didn't have it at Blockbuster. They didn't have it at Vidiots. They, <laughs> they had it at Hollywood video. Uh, this South African film called uh, And the Gods Were Monsters. And um, it was really like the only film that had authentic um, South African accents like on film like it's it is known as a very hard accent you know you can you can see films of people who learn South African accents and are putting it on but it's very hard to find actual South African people speaking on film especially back then I'm sure it's fine now with YouTube but I didn't have that <laughs> so so I rented that movie and and then he and I worked on what he knew of it but he also wasn't like perfect you know we just tried to slide in the flat ease you know like it's not south africa it's south africa and you know and and just try to like slide in some flavor so they could get a taste of what it might be and then um when i went to do the screen test for it i screen tested against another girl who was a native south african <laughs> and they flew us both to toronto and we spent a week together and um, I had a dialect coach and I was convinced I wasn't going to get it. You know what I mean? I was convinced like, this is like the, this is literally the hardest accent of all time. All actors know this. I had been told this for the last like three months that I had been auditioning for this movie. You know, I was like, there's no way that I can compete with this girl. And I'm not saying that I did a better accent than her at all. Um, but somehow, somehow they chose me and I, and I was really grateful. And then on set, um, for the first few weeks, I didn't, I tried to speak in a South African accent the whole time. My dialect coach was the guy who played my father. The guy who played my, the people who played my mother and father were native South Africans. So she coached me for my, the mother coached me, uh, for my screen test. And then the dad took me over and coached me for the film. Um, and originally they had wanted it to be more Dutch and more Afrikaans. So for the screen test, I had a much thicker Afrikaans because that is actually more historically accurate to, to the kind of accent that Mari would have had. Um, but it was so hard to understand that then they lightened it up and brought it more to a British um upper class accent so that it was easier to understand the truth is is that mari would have had a lower class accent <laughs> that was a lot but we were talking about star trek <laughs> yeah it's kind of just funny too so you're telling me the story and i bet the reason you got the role was because the actual south african person started to like pick up your american accent <laughs> and i bet it threw her off <laughs> that's genius that's genius machiavellian of you yes i incepted him <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, but that's really cool. Though. I mean, because accents are really tough to do well. And I mean, both times we're talking about these two roles. He did it, I think, very convincingly. Um, and, you know, I do want to talk about, too, the fact that this is Star Trek, like we mentioned here. So uh, in your second appearance, Persistence of Vision, you did get to spend some time on the ship. So number one, what did you think of the set? And number two, did you sit in the captain's chair? I did! You I was did. just going to say, I slept, I sat in the captain's chair. <laughs> I did. We have pictures somewhere, and I and I haven't been able to find them. I have, like physical pictures of it somewhere um but yeah man i got to sit in the gadgets and i got to like go and push all the fake buttons <laughs> what do you mean fake <gasps> huh what do you mean fake buttons <laughs> nothing <laughs> um it, it was it was so cool and you know and they would open up they're like this is how the doors open up and they were like phew, phew. like it was just it was it was insanely cool. It felt like I was in space. Like, it, it, it honestly, I was a kid. It was still easy to sort of suspend my, you know, reality, suspend my imagination a little bit. And I, I did spend a little bit of time prepare, you know, pretending that I was actually in space. And it was <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> I would do the same thing. Uh, yeah, I, oh, I don't man. know if I'd sit in the captain's chair because that's a lot of responsibility to take on. I was ready. <laughs> I was 
it's ready. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I'm so glad I did. I'm so glad I did. Still, my dream is to be the captain. We'll see. Maybe one day. It's never too late. Yeah. Well, we have one more Star Trek episode to talk about, too. And this is season three. So two years later, uh, you returned as, in my opinion, I, I feel like you know, this is my little nerd headcanon here. Uh, you played the character named Bell, but I, I feel like that was still just Beatrice. It was just the doctor's version of Bell, yeah. the, the doctor's version of Beatrice. That was, that was kind of how, because it was another one of those things where they were like, um, they wanted to cast me, but I'd already been on the show. And yeah. so they had to run it by a bunch of people. And that was what they ended up coming up with. They were like, you know, it, she's a hologram. She's like a program, you know, within the computer or the AI or whatever. And, and she's allowed to like be reused, parts of her be reused and recalibrated and made into this thing for the doctor. So I was so excited. I was like, oh my God, are you kidding me? I get to play two characters on Star Trek. I was so stoked. <laughs> um yeah that that was fun too that was super fun yeah this time around you're working with a lot more of the cast especially yeah. you're working very closely with robert ricardo i got to spend a little bit of time at roxanne dawson uh, and plus again you're now with this whole hollow family so i mean it's a lot more folks to hang out with and, and perform with uh so i mean yeah just general memories of working with the bridge crew working with robert ricardo and roxanne and just uh any, any memories of your time on set that stand out to you it was the first time that i had um done a show that had three cameras going mm -hmm. um which is intense that that's a lot because you know usually you get you know you have your over it's over your shoulder you're talking to the people and then it's on you but it, so you get sort of moments and and you can be a little bit more free with your movement um i i've always been pretty good at staying in the same movement so that it's easy for the editors and all of that stuff but when you're doing more than two cameras, I mean, even with two cameras, when you're doing multiple cameras, your movements have to be so precise because even though you're not blocking your own over when you're moving your hand like this to get your fork, you're blocking your mother's from this camera angle or you're blocking this person's from this camera angle. And so that was like a real, uh, a real experience. For me but it was also really cool because then it captured every single thing that you did and it moved us along very quickly i'm speaking mostly of the dinner scene yeah um, yeah that's a pretty big a, scene yeah it was a big undertaking and uh and i remember just being like whoa and, and i always made friends with um with the camera crew so i i was like how do you do this like i was just like so 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 into it um so that was really fun the crew on star trek was so cool they were so nice to me and really into how much i was into the crew uh and wanted to teach me stuff and did the camera operators let you actually do any stuff with cameras when you weren't on screen oh, oh my god no you can't <laughs> you can't touch the cameras you're not in the, the union camera. no no, I can't even move anything. I, I remember um, being on True Blood and wanting to, I, I hung back and watched them set up one of these gigantic scenes um, in the fairy land. There was like this huge performance scene and I and they allowed me on set. I kind of also snuck in just to watch, <laughs> just to watch them like put together the set and, and tried to stay out of the way. And, and I wanted, somebody was trying to lift something and I tried to help them and they were like, oh, they're like, oh, right, 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 right. I can't do that. You're a union. <laughs> I'm not supposed to help. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I, I definitely didn't touch any Star Trek cameras. That's for sure. <laughs> now, you got to do a lot of scenes with Robert Picard, a lot of pretty intimate scenes, too. So I, I'd love to hear, you know, again, what it's like work with him doing a scene, but also how is he off camera? He's so cool. Oh, my God. One of my favorite people to work with. He He had such a perfect mixture of just like, warmth and professionalism um he was just he was great he was just like a a cool regular person i don't have like a specific story but i just remember really really liking him and feeling like when he was on set like able to really just like relax into the experience of of creating and shooting like there there wasn't um there wasn't any kind of nervousness you know he he just really it, he he created a warmth you know and lead actors they do really set the tone for you know for whatever you're doing um and so he he really did that very well he set the tone for the set and it was just very relaxed and cool and 
and everybody was on it like a well-oiled machine, but nobody was stressed. It was great. He was awesome. I would love to work with him again. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Yeah, and just because I think we didn't actually say the name of the episode yet. For folks who are wondering, this is season three Voyager, real life. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I mean, this episode, it starts off fun and it starts off kind of campy and silly, but it gets really serious. And, you know, big spoilers for anybody who hasn't seen the episode. Uh, Bella doesn't make it out of this one alive. So. I die! But, but the thing is here, I mean, this is not like your typical Star Trek death. This isn't like, you know, you're in a phaser fight and you're zapped. Like, no, I mean, this is very different. And I want to talk about that here because, like, one, it's a child who's dying. Two, it's something we don't really see happen. Like, like I said, there's no phaser fight. There's no like big action scene. Just, it just is life. Yeah. And three, it's just like, it's so realistic compared to what the rest of the franchise does in terms of tone and just approach to this kind of a thing here. I mean, this isn't like yeah. Spock in Wrath of Khan where he's dying <laughs> to save the entire crew, that kind of thing. Like you just die because yeah. that's the way life is and we have no control over it. And it's a really rough message. Uh, it's really powerful. I mean, I got to tell you this episode, you know, I wasn't sure how I felt about it, but then just rewatching, I'm like, wow, this is like powerful stuff. This is really good. And again, your performance was amazing. Uh, like, it really got me to really feel for the character. And, uh, you know, I'm curious, you know, did you really understand the power of the scene when you were doing it as a kid? And was it a challenge for you to do this kind of a death scene at your age? I, I think I thought I understood, but I honestly had never understood until I had my own child. <laughs> um, how how rough that scene was but i but i do remember it was a very big deal on set and there was nervousness around it because you know i remember people going nobody likes to watch a child die on a, you know and this you know that's why people don't do it in tv and i was like people don't do it in tv like i i just didn't i didn't totally understand like you know you don't kill the kid you know <laughs> i didn't understand that. yeah um so i but but of course I got the depth of just like loss and um, yeah, loss on, on, on any level, but you don't, you, you don't really understand how pain. Now, if anything comes close to like hurting a child on a podcast I'm listening to, like I love true crime podcasts, but if it has anything to do with kids now, I'm like, I can't, I can't listen to it. I can't, I can't do it because I just, I can't, it's, it's really, it's really scary. I, I connect too much to with the possible pain of the parent and um and I'm sure that anybody watching that episode that actually had gone through anything similar to that where they did lose their child or almost lose their child I bet that was a rough one and and um I guess brave would be the word for the creators for doing that mm. you know for making that the thing but I think that it was important for his character you know what I mean it was really important for that arc it was important to tell that story and and I think that in some ways because it's not depicted that much in television I, I bet there were some people who came away feeling seen you know that that it was actually dealt with in a in a really serious way and and um yeah and they got to experience it through this character that they really like you know it's so different. It's just like an anachronism in Star Trek that this thing happened. And, uh, yeah. you know, I want to reiterate, too, it's something we talk about a lot on the show here, that when you're on a Star Trek show and you're performing on a Star Trek show, mm -hmm. you don't really have time for rehearsal. You just kind of <laughs> go. So I'm kind of wondering here, because, I mean, yeah, this is a pretty crucial scene. It's got to be done right. And you did it excellently. I mean, like, yeah. I, I hate that I'm talking to you. And, like, two of the roles I watched you and got me to cry. <laughs> and this is one <laughs> of them. And, yeah, like, you know, I'm just wondering, like, did you work with Robert Picardo before this? I mean, how did you guys make this magic actually happen? You know, he was just really warm. And I think that he and I, and maybe this is just a testament to what a great actor he was. Like we, we felt a warmth for each other or at least a warmth that I believed, you know? And I remember being really moved by his performance and by the scene, even in the scene. And one of the hardest things was having to die and, be silent because I was emotionally moved by it you know um we we didn't get a lot of rehearsal but there was also respect around the whole thing you know um so we were able to to take our time in the moment um also I was so excited that I like put clear nail polish on my nails the night before which was I don't know if you know this but women in Star Trek don't wear nail polish and it was a really big deal when they noticed it. 
And um, so we had to, <laughs> another time when I delayed production of Star Trek. <laughs> uh, I'm going to subtitle this episode, French Dip and Fingernails. <laughs> the Lindsay Hahn interview. <laughs> the Lindsay on in Star Trek story oh my gosh it's true that must have been such a nightmare for them um but yeah so my my nails were shiny the lights hit my nails and they were shiny and nobody had um nail polish remover because nobody wears nail polish on Star Trek and apparently that's a thing that everybody knows but I was a kid and I felt like my scene the next day was really important and so I wanted to look <laughs> what I was thinking um so I painted my nails with this like clear nail polish so they had to um use makeup to like to like damp down my nails and and but he like everybody around me was flipping out and he was so kind to me and that kind of brought us even closer you know what I mean because of course like they're flipping out they're like the fans will freak out if this kid has nail polish and what do we do and oh my god and how did your mom let this happen and you know and and all of that stuff that happens around like a production that is thousands and thousands of dollars you know every hour and especially costing thousands and thousands of dollars in a delay you know so everybody's panicking nobody wants to be the reason why that's happening and uh and he was just so cool. And he was like, don't worry about it. They'll figure it out. It's fine. Don't worry about it. And to just have him as that anchor while like the adults around me were flipping out was, was amazing. And then I think added to the emotional bond in that scene. So it was kind of the best thing that happened. Don't tell them I said that, but <laughs> like, this girl, <laughs> her damn French dip. I know. Uh french dip and her clear fingernail polish <laughs> now did you watch these three episodes when you were a kid when they first aired yeah, yeah. what did you think of them i was so proud what are you talking about? it was so cool <laughs> like i um and i remember being moved by the death scene um and i wanted you know with beatrice i was sad because i wanted to go back i felt like i wanted more of that story and and i really liked working with the crew I really liked working on the on the set and so I, I was sad that that was over so soon and so um yeah when when I was able to come back it, it was cool but I was also sad that that was over so soon and I was always kind of secretly hoping that they'd bring me back again for another another holodeck character you know um because it I just the experience was awesome I was you know the set teacher I was like playing cards and you know and it's just fun it was really fun and it was all um you know I love working on lots there's this very like I don't know like cool in feeling like you feel like you're in the club and um and I'm pretty sure that was on the Paramount lot and that's one of my favorite lots so you know it's just it was nice and and then to like nerd out and be able to see myself on Star Trek I mean hello that's like the coolest thing ever <laughs> I would just need to find a way to get you into the Star Wars franchise so you can complete it since, you know. Yeah, you come Han on. Solo. <laughs> I'm talking to Han Solo here who loves French dip. I do. <laughs> Work it in, JJ. Work it in. <laughs> so these days, you've also pivoted more so behind the camera for a lot of things. And that's kind of what you've been doing lately, last like decade, and maybe more. Uh, mm -hmm. Directing films. Uh, you know, I know you have your group, the Happy Canyon Club. Uh, so you know, talk to me a little bit about what you're doing these days and uh, how you essentially moved yourself behind the camera. Um. So probably the first person to tell me that I should direct is Kevin Hooks from The Color of Friendship when I was 14. He was like, you're so interested in all of this. You could direct. And I and I thought that it was just like too big of a of a thing. I was like, I'd never be able to do that. I can only hold one character in my head, like not a bunch. It was some, it was just a it's the role on set that I respected the most. Um, and then. I, I eventually worked with enough people that told me the same thing that I was like, maybe I should try this. So the first time I really directed anything was my own music video for my band, The Han Solo Project. It's a song called Addicted. And um, and I did everything. I did the, I, <laughs> the only thing I didn't do was one wardrobe piece that my friend, um, Sheridan Irwin, who is a designer, had from her like graduation show it was the straight jacket dress. And I was like, that's perfect. Um, but other than that, I I was the total set, set designer. I, I, I did everybody's makeup. I did my own makeup, wigs, all this stuff. I did all the stuff. Um, 
And, and I was like, I love this. And, and I, I, cause I wanted to test it out on something that was <laughs> on, on myself so that if I was terrible, I wasn't ruining someone else's thing, you know? Um, and so since then we've done a bunch of short films, Happy Canyon Club started because, um, my husband is a writer and, um, another one of our friends is, a just in general creator he um he does special effects and and uh writes and his name is toby Bryan. and um you should look up his animation and stuff on his instagram hint, um, hint. yeah <laughs> um but you know we all do stuff separately but then happy canyon club is sort of our um community and everybody just jumps in and pitches in and we used to put plays on in the house you know it hasn't really happened so much since covid and babies and all of that stuff but it, it was just sort of this community of of not just the three of us of other people we we have poets and painters and all of these people who have lended their talents to the many short films that we've made the music videos we've made and now this really kooky film that we're not done with <laughs> called hanky panky uh that we're finishing now that's one we alluded to at the very start of the show, I believe, with uh, the yeah. napkin reference. Yes. <laughs> it's about a, uh, a napkin that talks. <laughs> and, um, and it's very zany and very uh, almost like, not like as, not as slapstick as Airplane, but definitely has some moments. It's very, it's a very kooky movie, but we've also made like really darkly serious sci-fi stuff. And so we've, we're just kind of experimenting and, and, um, you know, we sort of switch off with who takes the reins as far as, you know, creatively spearheading the whole thing. And then we support each other and, um, you know, on Hanky Panky, every actor was a producer and every actor was required to hold a boom mic when they weren't on scene uh, on on screen and um we only had one aside from our dp we only had one crew person that was just dedicated crew and the rest was like everything else was done by the actor so it was an experimental thing we all went up to a cabin in utah and lived there with each other and did it and didn't kill each other in real life which is nice <laughs> we're all still friends <laughs> um uh, but then I'm, I've also, right before the pandemic, I, I was hired to do this like crazy dark revenge fantasy movie um, that then I, I rewrote. And then because of the pandemic, it, it got pushed and then I had a baby. And so like, you know, it's, it's happening, but the pandemic slowed everything down, but it was a nice little, um, it was a nice break for me. To, and, and I think also like probably how everybody feels with the pandemic it, it was hard, but it was also kind of a way to sort of get rid of like the layers of bullshit and like get down to who you actually are and what you actually want out of this life and who you want to spend time with, you know? And so, it, you know, that also has to do with art for me. Yeah, and we'd be remiss too to not to mention this since we're on the subject of directors here. I want to just do a shout out and you could talk about working with this guy if you'd like. Uh, you know, the episode Real Life was directed by Anton Williams and yes. that's Potsy from Happy Days. And for Oh my God, fans, I... I thought I had mentioned it and I didn't mention it. He... I, I, I like skipped that question. I had it there, but yeah, like, you know, for, for Trekkies out there, you know, we know also he's from uh, the very famous DS9 episode, Paper Moon, which is like one of the roughest ones to sit through. So again, he's doing two pretty <laughs> rough episodes here, but yeah. What, what is yeah. Anson Williams like as a director? He was so cool. And he was actually also one of those people who, who was like, you know, the only way that you make it in this industry is if you have your hands in all of the pots. He, you know, he was like, you got to learn how to do everything. Um, and so he was encouraging me to talk to the crew. He was the reason why I can't believe I didn't even mention him. That's so crazy. Um, but he, he was so wonderful, so kind, um, a great director and definitely handled some of the most intense, you know, content ever. Um, and, and I also really liked happy days. So, you know, there I go nerding out again. <laughs> it, was, it was wonderful. I watched a lot of TV. Okay. <laughs> Just a lot of TV as a kid and a lot of movies and a big fan, big fan of it all. <laughs> you know, I also know that you are doing some music stuff too these days, right? Can you tell us about that? Yeah, well, I mean, I'm I'm writing a new album now. 
but um, I actually just put up on Spotify. My husband did this for my birthday because I can never get anything together to do anything. Um, so for my birthday last year, my husband put up my band, The Han Solo Project on Spotify and, and our, old, uh, our old record, which is called Neon Gods. Um, so yeah, definitely check it out if you want to listen to, you know, some some early 2000s, you know. Not, I guess it was kind of mid, mid to that teen, to that, it's not early 2000s. It's like, it's like teens, 2000 teens, okay? Yeah. Late 2000 teens. Teen? Yeah, 20 teens. Um, but it just got put out on Spotify, so it looks like it came out recently. <laughs> Fair enough. No one knows the difference. Unless they listen to the show, they won't know. So yeah, yeah. Uh, either way, brand support... new, brand new music just dropped. There you go. <laughs> so check out the Han Solo project. Get Lindsay some more money. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> not just the Star Trek royalties, but the Spotify royalties. We want those too. Thank you. Yes, please. All right. So Lindsay, as we're coming to a close here, I just got a few last things for you. I want a lightning round with you real quick. So Whoa. yeah, I know okay. it's going to be, even though they're probably the toughest questions I'm going to ask you today, but uh, we'll see how this turns out. So first okay. thing here, best gig you ever had and the worst gig you ever had oh my gosh um easy questions okay best honestly best gig i ever had was i was very stoked i was young and i did the commercial for hook for the vhs of hook and they put me on a giant cord so that i could fly through the air and pulled me back with the machine and then just let me go and fly through the air and that was just so fun so that's that was the best one and i i honestly can't think of a worst one and i know that that's such like a political answer but um but I, you know everything's a learning experience that i i value for whatever reason even if it's hard even if the people on it are assholes <laughs> fair enough fair enough how about a moment from your performing career that was the most challenging for you that became the most rewarding Ooh, a moment. I know this is supposed to be lightning, but wow, these really yeah. are deep questions. I call them lightning round. I just lied to my guests, basically. Oh, the most challenging, but the most rewarding was probably Village of the Damned. Mm -hmm. um, it was probably Village of the Damned. That was really hard, but that, you know, it's like, I feel like young boys in tribes, like, go off into the wilderness to become men. I feel like that's, that's what I did. <laughs> I feel like I went off into the wilderness to become a woman adult actor i don't know <laughs> but whatever it was i became it <laughs> it's like your john carpenter baptism basically yes exactly exactly how about most valuable piece of advice that someone ever told you about life or acting or even directing uh, that you still think about today um the most valuable piece of life advice was given to me by bobby roth who I am not trying to blow smoke up his skirt. He is my father-in-law now, however. <laughs> and he directed me in a movie called, and this is how I met him and how I met his son. He directed me in a movie called Brave New Girl for ABC Family. And he told me to love myself the way I would love my child and to forgive myself the way I would forgive my child. I was 19 and um, just really, really made an impact on me. And I still think about it to this day um as far as career i mean tess harper that that comments about you just need to think something and um you just need to think something and and the camera will catch it is was was really good and i've always thought about it since then and um my acting coach always says this thing and always has it doesn't have to be good it just has to be real and I think I've carried that throughout my entire life, not just artistically, but like in, in life as well. It's like, just, just authenticity would be great. That's awesome. Please. <laughs> did that answer the question? That, that totally did. That was, that was okay. like overachieving answering the question. Okay, so okay. Good job there. You gave us all the things. That's great. <laughs> I did all the things. So last thing, Lindsay, what's the best thing about being a part of the Star Trek universe? The family, the family with the fans. I mean, I I cannot believe how much um, I still feel welcomed in a community that of, of something that I did so long ago, and and I still feel valued, which like honestly in this industry, you are only as good as the project you're about to do, and um, to to be a part of something like Star Trek, and I'm not really sure that there are that many other communities like that. The horror community is a little bit like this, but the Star Trek community, I feel 
just like I've always been valued. And actually, as time goes on, I'm more valued, which also as a woman is, is a rare commodity. So <laughs> I'm, I'm really, really appreciative. And um, yeah, and I jump at any opportunity to, to feed the community in any way. So a great answer. And, uh, you know, just apology to you and any fans who are hoping to hear some true blood talk. Uh, I unfortunately don't know anything about that show. There's only so many hours in the day to get ready for an interview like this, but uh, I'm sure you've done anything before enough. about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we're, we're going to leave that for someone else to cover. Uh, but, you know, I love it. I love it. Yes. Yeah, so I just want to tell you, Lindsay, you know, I didn't know what to expect when I started digging into your career because, you know, again, I, I'm coming into you as like a child actor on Voyager, but like I really enjoyed looking at what you do, your, what you did. Uh, I was blown away by a lot of the stuff, too. I mean, like, really, the Trek stuff is cool, but you did some really outstanding work beyond Trek. Uh, so, you know, it's it's really great stuff. I mean, you've been on screen, you've been singing, you're directing now. I mean, you're doing a lot of amazing things. I can't wait to see what you do next. Uh, you. So, again, just thank you for being willing to share your story with us today. And, uh, yeah, it's been real wonderful chatting with you. Thank you. It was such a pleasure chatting with you. That's it for this week's episode of Trek Untold. Until next time, don't forget to follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Trek Untold, all one word. If you'd like to directly support this podcast, please consider becoming a Patreon supporter over on patreon.com slash trekuntold, which gives you access to some great perks that can't be beat. Or pick up some merchandise from our store, or use my Amazon shop link to check out all kinds of different Star Trek merchandise. Links for all these things are in the show notes. Shout out to Triple Fiction Productions for being a key sponsor of Trek Untold. Don't forget to check them out and all of the fine folks whose ads you've seen or heard on this podcast, too. If you have any questions, feedback, or comments for the show, or would like to suggest a guest or discuss sponsorship options for any of these episodes in the future, send me a message at trekuntold at gmail.com. I hope to see you here again as we uncover more untold stories from Star Trek and beyond and get to know even more amazing people who have contributed to this ever-expanding universe. Until next time, I'm Matthew Kaplowitz, and remember, fortune favors the bold. Trek Untold is sponsored by treksphere.com. Promoting fan-produced Star Trek content in all forms is powered by the Rageworks Podcasting Network and is affiliated with Nerd News Today.